Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good evening. Drink more water. Uh, good evening, and welcome to the Aspen Institute's McCloskey Speaker Series program. I'm Crystal Logan, Vice President of Aspen Community Programs here at the Institute. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our speakers today. Uh, but first, our gratitude goes to all of you for joining us this evening and uh, joining us for all of our events this summer, and also to Bonnie and Tom McCloskey for their generous support of this program. <laughs> Emma Allen is cartoon editor of The New Yorker and edits humor on newyorker.com. She has been a member of the magazine's editorial staff since 2012 and has written more than 100 stories for the publication on a wide range of topics. In addition to editing cartoons for the magazine and written humor and comics online, she works with the New Yorker Radio Hour to produce humor adaptations for the air and alongside, alongside Condé Nast Entertainment to publish comedy videos. Ben Davis, our moderator tonight, is author of two books, one of which was named the best art book of the decade in 2019, called <laughs> 9.5 Theses on Art and Class. Uh, he has been Artnet News's national arts critic since uh, 2016 and has been called one of the five most influential art critics in the US. His writings have been featured in the New York Times, New York Magazine, and Slate, and many other venues. I'm honored to welcome you both to the Aspen Institute. Thanks for being here, and over to you, Ben. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, so we are going to have a very robust, serious, and substantial conversation about um, the sub on the subject of humor and cartoons and the changing nature of, of both. Um, but before we did, I wanted to begin with um, my own little story about Emma Allen. Oh, Jesus. Um, we've known each other for a decade. We, we, we worked together at a, at a now forgotten art magazine called Art Info. And um, even then, Emma was someone who could make something substantial and attention getting out of, how do you know, silly stuff. I remember her big hit was um, an article about uh, Cooper the cat, a, 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 cat, cat photographer. a cat photographer whose owners had put a camera around its neck so you could see what it was up to. <laughs> but what I remember most about Emma what, or not most about Emma, but something I remember about our time is My that eulogy. is that when you <laughs> left, Emma, I remember our boss at the time saying to you, "You're throwing your life away. <laughs> You'll never work again." So never work, yeah, in journalism again. Never work in journalism again. So how did you go from that to being a, a cartoon editor <laughs> of, the, of the New Yorker? Um, I remember I had a little post-it note in my hand that just said, "Whatever he says, just be like, thank you. This has been great." Goodbye. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I went on to freelance for art publications. I had mainly columns, one in The Observer that mocked the art world, which was my favorite part of the art world, that it was ridiculous. Um, and uh, I eventually then got a meeting with Susan Morrison, who was at The New Yorker and um, former Spy Magazine editor at its Talk the Town, Shouts and Murmurs, working on a biography of Lorne Michaels now, who she was an assistant to in her early days. Anyway, got to sit down with her. There was no job available. I just like chewed her ear off for hours. Um, at the end, I called my mom and I was like, now I can die. And my mother was like, what? You're dying? And I was like, no, <laughs> but I've been inside the New Yorker offices. <laughs> um, so some months passed, I kept writing about art and how silly it was. And um, I eventually got a text from Susan very late at night saying, have you moved to China? And I was like, do you want me to? <laughs> and she was like, no, but I need an assistant. So that was 10 years ago. And I started as an assistant and talk of the town and shouts and murmurs. And then I built up a humor platform for us online called Daily Shouts with written stuff and drawn stuff and video stuff, um, sort of just recruiting all the people in comedy I was excited about to write and do stuff for us. Um, and then about five years ago, David was like, do you want to also do cartoons? And I like left his office thinking it was a joke, which is like 
honestly, if that's what you think is a joke, you shouldn't be editing jokes because it's not a very good joke. Um, but yeah, so now I'm, I do all of those things. And it seems to be, it seems to be going pretty well. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, I, I, as far as I can tell, you know, your tenure is very well reviewed so far. Um, it's uh, quite a job. I understand that you uh, get something like 1,500 submissions a week. Yeah. <laughs> I get about 1,500 gag cartoons in my email inbox every week, and then all the other written emails. So, so just give us a sense uh, how, how you can possibly filter that much material. I think people have like a vision of it that it's this like just me like laughing and laughing and laughing. Everyone's like, you have the best job in the world. Um, what it really is, I feel like more than that is like a montage from like Rocky where I'm just like, I start out and I'm like pumped. And I'm like going in like, here we go. And then like, then I like really break down <laughs> for a while and then I get back up. And I'm like slowly going up. But yeah, so it's basically, it's, it's a long slog and it's like a huge culling process because I bring 60 cartoons then into a weekly meeting with David Remnick and then we buy 20. So it's 1,500 to 20. So it's just like slashing and burning and ruining people's dreams. And yeah, by the end, I'm like totally glassy eyed. I'll never laugh again. Yeah, there's this whole phenomenon called rejected by the New Yorker. It's like a, a, people posting things that, that weren't accepted by Emma. I mean, uh, how does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, I wish they'd make it just rejected by Emma. I could really have a brand there. Um, no, I mean, when I first started, so it's, yeah, reject, hashtag rejected New Yorker cartoon is like a big thing on Instagram. Um, at first, it made me feel really sad <laughs> because I felt like I was just, you know, hurting all of these very nice people. <laughs> um, no, but I, I've come to realize, like, the bad math of it all precedes me, and you know, hopefully, I've created some other venues for people to do graphic work and, you know, get paid more to do different things at the New Yorker that relate to cartoons. But um, now it's like I'm sort of. I sort of love it, because it's, it's the community of these people who work in isolation and are rejected all the time, and they're like rallying together and exchanging notes, and you know, it's, it makes something that is inherently um, a tragicomic pursuit, like a, a community. Do you, ever, do you ever look at them and, and think like, oh man, maybe I was wrong about it. Oh that. yeah, well, and also a lot of them are ones where I was like, David, David, David. David, we have to publish this. It was right on the edge. Yeah, and he's like, I don't like it. It didn't make the cut. Maybe languished in the maybe bin for part of the meeting. But um, so, and in, in that way, sometimes those go viral, and then I can be like, David, David, remember how you rejected that one? The like, internet the speaks. Internet? The internet yeah. speaks. Yeah. Um, well, I do want to uh, get into the sort of the evolution of of comedy in our storm-tossed moment, but maybe let's let's talk about the you know there's a. You step, you're the fourth cartoon editor of The New Yorker. You stepped into a hollowed institution with, that people, people care about very much, um, have very fixed ideas about what it is and what it represents. So let's maybe, you have a couple of cartoons you picked out. Yeah, I don't know. Are they um, up anywhere? I can't see. Where your uh, this is where your, your precious clicker oh, comes to play. <gasps> Hey. Yeah, okay, this, we well, this is just a cartoon that a friend drew for me when I first started 10 years ago of me sorting shouts and murmurs for Eustace Tilly. People do often submit things where they're like, this is really more of a murmur than a shout, and it's just like a really depressing <laughs> personal essay, and it's like, no, it's none of those things. So then this is gonna take us back all the way to the, uh, very the first earliest issue. days. This is the very first issue of The New Yorker, Ethel Plummer, 1925. Um, you said you got it. I don't think I get it. You tried to explain it to me, and I blushed. Uh, it's, uh, it's a classic, she's a classic <laughs> flapper who's uh, out for a good time. Yeah, with uncle, who you tried I to explain to me think he's not her, her uncle. uncle. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, no, so cartoons were in the very first issue of The New Yorker. Um, it was, Harold Ross uh, envisioned it as a comic weekly. Uh, this obviously is by a woman in the very first issue. I don't think it's very funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, this, this is... This one on the other hand. This one on the other hand. It holds Bar up. We're... Barbara Sherman, 1928. The caption is, you're a very intelligent little woman, my dear. So it goes along. It's a multi-panel comic um, where he's just mansplaining to her and then at the end, you know, congratulates her on being very intelligent. Could have been published last week. Truly. I mean, 
I don't run in these circles myself. <laughs> but, but yeah, sure. Um, Oh, I just I threw this one in because, I don't know, in, in the vast history of New Yorker cartoons, I love this one because it actually, the phrase uh, back to the drawing board was coined by Peter Arno. Um, and my other favorite detail about this cartoon, which is the kind of thing you think about when you look at 1,500 cartoons a week, is the way his toe is stepping out of the frame. Um, so he's actually like leaving the drawing and going back to the drawing board, which I think is just like a beautiful moment. That is a... Only from the cartoon <laughs> editor kind of detail. That you... um, am I answering your question? <laughs> so really, that, 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 that phrase, back to the, phrase back to the drawing board comes from, uh, yeah. comes from New York cartoons. Fascinating. Yeah, this one I threw in because this was one that um, hung in my uh, kitchen in Manhattan when I was growing up uh, because it was sort of like a truce between me and my mother because it so perfectly described <laughs> our relationship when I was a teenager. And I've talked to Raj Chast about it since, um, and she said it's one of the few cartoons that she's ever done where it's actually taken from a line that her kids said to her. <laughs> like, people always think that cartoonists are just, like, going on the public bus and, like, writing down what people are saying, which is actually, like, a small, as far as I understand it, from all of them, uh, like, portion of what they, it's, it's often like this amalgamation of like an idea that they had and an ad that they saw and a character that they witnessed and, you know, the couch and their great uncle's living, you know, it's, 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 you know, it's why it can only come from their brains and everyone who thinks that they could come up with a perfect New Yorker cartoon actually can't. <laughs> I'm sure you all could, but. Do <laughs> you want to see more? Keep them coming, yeah. <laughs> um, I love this one. Roz also, so, you know, there were the early days, he said, she said cartoons. There were the uh, decades after where it was, um, oh, yeah, sorry. This one says the glass floor is the title, and she is thinking, maybe if I just sit very, very still, nothing will happen, and the floor is cracking <laughs> underneath her. Um, so, you know, a woman in the very first issue of The New Yorker, woman cartoonist, um, and there was a real break in the sort of mm -hmm. 60s and 70s. Roz, Jack. As Beaver, in they didn't publish a lot of female cartoons. Yeah, in no. Time and, it, and it was sort of like it hit a, it hit a sort of um, self-imitative cycle, I think. There are ex obviously like people who don't, um, aren't covered by that. But you know, like 78, Roz Chass came in. Um, and Jack Ziegler around the same time and just did these cartoons that were like so wild and weird and different to the point where someone at a party asked Lee Lorenz, the then cartoon editor of Roz Chast, oh, Roz Chast's family owed him money right after they had started publishing her because people thought they were so wackadoodle. Um, right, as in the, the, like what is this person even doing? It didn't even read to, to as like something that should belong in the New Yorker. Yeah, and she herself, I mean, she was really submitting to the Village Voice when she started and, you know, didn't, you know, send a few into the New Yorker thinking that it was essentially an well, impossibility. That's, that's a really fascinating because then you get the sense of kind of that 60s, uh, 70s alt-weekly energy mm -hmm. kind of being folded back into the institution in New Yorker, which, which kind of, I think, connects to the larger theme of, of this talk, which is, you know, how, how humor has evolved and... Um, you've touched on two of the directions I wanted to go in, in just what you're saying. So there's, I think, I guess first talk about um, the tropes of New Yorker cartoons and something you um, have said when you've been interviewed is something that you say to cartoonists is, you know, don't try and make something that looks like it belongs in a New Yorker. Uh, try and make something you think is funny. Yeah, I always think about it as like when people are out in screenwriting when they write a bunch of spec, spec, spec scripts for shows, you know, like Mad About You or like, you know, or worse, it's like, you know, a New Yorker cartoon is thinking that they're sort of like creating a scene from a Noel Coward play or something where it's like there's this sense that they're frozen in time or fusty or just like raw or drawing room or, um, which I don't think is the case. I mean, if you think about like one of Jack Ziegler's, um, late great Jack Ziegler's like, 
great cartoons, I think from the 80s, is it just says life after Mozart, and there's just a can and a wine bottle and a pencil and an open plane. <laughs> like, that's not like a Hamilton cartoon of people being like, oh, but darling, uh, you know, it's like, um, so it hasn't been that really, except in, you know, it's sort of worst moments. Um, and in its best moments, I think it reflects, you know, these, they're not frozen in time, but they're also often evergreen. So it's these, like the Barbara Sherman, it's these things where it's like a, someone who is very gimlet-eyed uh, is able to observe something that is very specific and yet somehow universal and like can encompass not just one you know, point of view or one perspective, but you know, sort of like represents all these different things that are happening in the world right now. Sure, there are there are tropes. Certainly, there are specific oh. tropes you see a lot th that people associate with a New Yorker that you look to avoid. Oh, I mean, well, there are a lot of tropes and cliches that, while they're harder to do originally now, I mean, with each passing year, Rapunzel, Kings. Grim Reaper, Desert Island. Grim I mean, Reaper, Desert Island, yeah. These things, these things, there are so many of them. Um, they're not like out, they're, they're still in circulation and it's just harder and harder to do them in an original way. There are some, there's like the first bluebird, Robin of spring. I never remember which bird it is. I'm obviously <laughs> from New York City, not a bird person. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that's one where it's just like, it, there's such a long, robust history of cartoons that deal with it, but like I don't really know what it is, and like it's just not inherently really funny to me. Mm -hmm. And this is the sort of, this is the pain point for people who you know are like, how do, you get to choose, like you get to get rid of the bluebird problem of spring, and it's like, yes, I do. <laughs> that, that is my right. <laughs> It's your job, really, <laughs> to, to uh, keep yeah. it fresh. No, my job is also to like deal with all the cartoonists all the time, and my right is to occasionally get rid of an outdated trope that I don't want to see anymore. How close are you to the cartoonists? I mean, you've obviously mentioned talking to Roz Chast and some of the regulars. Like, how much of their lives enters into, into your life? A or lot. Or their anxieties? <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, a lot. I mean, they're like, when I started, and I was, well, much younger than many of them, so, like some of the greatest cartoonists ever were, still contribute to me in, in their 80s and 90s, um, you know, and I was coming in like a third of their age, like assuming that they would hate me. And they're, they're like the sweetest group of people on earth. They're not always the like most fun, <laughs> which is sort of something that I thought it was like, we're all just gonna be, again, just laughing and laughing. Um, no, but I mean, what they do is incredibly difficult, which is that each week, despite the odds being so stacked against them, being, having a cartoon purchase, they, you know, like spill their comedic artistic guts onto the page, send it off to me, the abyss that is like my email inbox. And I try to like spend as much time as I can being like advocate, cheerleader, reminding them that I'm still there, like confessor to their conspiracy. They come to me with conspiracy theories, they go to each other, they build up these theories about things that I no longer like. Oh, you mean they're like theorizing and trying to get inside your brain? Yeah, they have a Slack channel. They're like, the, the bluebird thing isn't working yeah. anymore. Like. Yeah, and then one of them will like come to me and be like, word on the street, and I'll be like, no. <laughs> like they're trying to sort of, you know, divine my like secret. And it's like, I just need to cut 1,500 to 20. <laughs> right. A lot of these are good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is about 50% uh, uh, people you've worked with before and 50% new people to the magazine, is that right? That right, maybe something like that. I, ha I think since I came in about five years ago, we've published like 80 or so new cartoonists. Some of them, you know, now being a full-time cartoonist as living is not really a job, so sometimes it's people who will come in and do a few here or there who are artists or comedy writers. and um, so it's, it's a gig for them now. Yeah, it's not always like the same consistency of, um, of submission or publication. So yeah, there are a bunch of new people, but yeah, it's, I mean, my, my like dual obligation of, or you know, personally prescribed, um, uh, aim to bring in new voices that represent like all the great stuff that's happening in the comic and graphic arts right now and also to be sort of friend and editor and dead mother and helper to the like 
greatest people in this field who have been doing it for mm -hmm. as long as I've been alive. It's not a hard one. It's like both of those things are very fun, and both of the groups of people make it very easy. And that is a balancing act, I imagine. Is like, <laughs> is like uh, keeping the good, keeping the old, uh, bringing in the new. How do you, how do you find new new voices? Um, well, before the pandemic, it was a lot of like going. Is it how much of it? I guess is yeah. is it people just cold writing you and you just discovering them in the inbox and how much of it is proactive? There are people um, who come in through, I'm loath to use this word because people guess, but this, what we call the slush pile, which is basically the open submissions. Um, very recently, Zoe C, I have one of her cartoons, but it's the very last one, I think. Um, she was a family court lawyer in Canada who was like cartooning. For you them. should click to it, I, I mean. All right. All right. You know, the, the dee, 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 cartoons dee, dee, teach us it is, um, oh. the text is always better with, okay, with the so pictures. Okay, so this is Zoe C. He's always, it's an early one. He's always been a little needy, but the despair is new. Um, I love her dogs. I think her dogs are like, this is early too. They've, they've only grown more <laughs> incredible. Um, right up there with George Booth dogs, et cetera. But um, yeah, so she came in, she blind submitted. Um, few years ago and she just recently like quit her job as a full-time illustrator and uh, comic book writer, graphic novelist, and just was um, a finalist for the Pulitzer in editorial cartooning. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, I mean, like things, funny things come in ev from at anywhere, everywhere. With shouts, I always used to say it was like the most, you know, democratic portion of the New Yorker because you can be funny. Like you don't need to have studied something for a million years to be really funny. Cartoons are harder because you do have to, the level of art like has to be. Um, you gotta master at least two things, yeah. word and image. <laughs> yeah, which is tough. Yeah. And be funny. I didn't realize how many other, let, let's go back and I think the audience will appreciate if we go back through. Um, okay, so these are just a few. To get a sense of the, the Emma Allen sensibility <laughs> here. I don't know, these are a few where I was like, I just picked ones that I liked that I published, and then I was like, oh no, this is like a dark portrait into my soul. Um, should we be responsible and cook dinner, or let ourselves experience a shred of joy and order in? This is certainly. Um, this one was published before I came on, but I love it, because I live at Bergen Street in Brooklyn. Due to an incident at Bergen Street Station, everything has changed and nothing will ever be the same, which I say to myself every morning when I commute. Um, this is Oliana Fink. She's smart, she's funny, she's beautiful, but she leaves her shoes all over the place. <laughs> Little Cinderella shoe. Um, I know the schools are great, but is this really the house we want to ride out the apocalypse in? This was a pandemic, like peak pandemic moment cartoon, and that was a really tough moment for comedy. Yes, I, I want to talk about that. Um, yeah, also because we just had banked all these cartoons, you know, we have sort of hundreds circulating waiting to run. But you know, they were all just a pe they were like jokes about people in large auditoriums or you know, like <laughs> whatever. But these things that suddenly felt so fraught. Like there were a lot of like, crowds of people not six feet apart. Yeah. Yeah, six feet apart in a cartoon really takes up a lot of um, space in the magazine. I don't know if I can get away with that. Um, something must be wrong with the crystal. You look older, but nothing else has changed. <laughs> Well, there's never going to be a perfect time to start a family. <laughs> Both blind dates went well, but Trevor came with a free tote bag. <laughs> you first. <laughs> Getting the neighbor to look after the cat before the hero's journey. <laughs> that really looks like my cat. I think it was before I got my cat. Maybe I picked my cat based on this cartoon. Uh, we've done all we can. It's out of our hands now. The bat signal is saying. Uh, and there, it. we're back to there. It? Well, I mean, I think that you get a sense of there. You have a little bit of an evolution. I mean, I think there's always kind of like a balance between uh, a sense of, you know, it has to hit some kind of human nerve, some kind of, has to, but it also, you know, has to do it in a funny way. But there's some dark stuff in there. There's also, I, I, I think you also see. Yeah, my stepdad thinks I only publish really dark. Oh, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> there's been a swing to the much darker. So, so something you, okay, so something that has, um, uh, I think you've, you already talked about this a little bit. Um, you have brought in a lot more women and people of color into the into the space. Um, it's a project in development, but I mean, what, 
talk about that. I mean, you've also worked on this uh, Funny Ladies project, which uh, about uh, female cartoonists. For yeah, Eliza Donnelly republished. She had done a version of it um, in the 90s and sort of updated it, and I helped write the introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, I, again, as I was saying, like when I was adding to our stable of Shouts writers, it was because I was like going around and seeing all this comedy and absorbing all this comedy and just seeing the like, you know, huge wealth of diverse voices that were out there doing incredible stuff. And like, you know, this isn't to say the New Yorker was, was doing this, but it's like, you know, I've, I've always been skeptical of this like holdover comedy world thing where it's like Har white Harvard lampoon guys filling writers' rooms or, mm -hmm. you know, SNL staff. Like, and, and, and so I like, you know, I wanted to like bring in all these exciting people that I was seeing. And, and it was sort of the same project with um, cartoons because while, as we started to say, like gag cartooning isn't really like a full-time job that a lot of people are pursuing, the graphic and comic arts world is like ballooning. It's just like bigger than ever and it is like more representative than, representative than ever and just includes like such, such incredible people um, doing like amazing new things. Um, I was just reading something today that like um, comic and graphic novel sales were up 60% in 2021 and it became a $2.5 billion industry in the US and Canada. So it's like, I don't know, there's this whole like gag cartooning, like is it like old fashioned? It's like, no, it's a part of this like incredibly robust world and it's just like creating the osmosis between the world so that people yeah. can, so the New Yorker can, can publish like more longer form stuff. Um, but imagine it's also like, it's partly you proactively um, seeking out people and partly like kind of running up the flag that, you know, you're welcome to submit here. Like, I, like come into my slush pile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think there is a sense that people just don't, you know, you have to kind of get the, get the motor started in terms of like making a space feel welcome for people who haven't seen themselves represented there before, right? Plus, I love it. You, you started to ask about like wh how you find people and it's like, it used to be going to comic book stores. Like anytime I land in any city, it's like go to the comic book store, like find the zine rack, like, figure out who the cool people making like really hyper local stuff are. Um, and then like going to comic comics conventions and just like toting home bags of things to pour over. Pandemic made it a little less like that and a little more like, you know, going on deep dives into Instagram rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, but, but the great thing is it's like cartoonists are so good now. It, you get the word out a little where it's like, I'm interested in, you know, this other type of stuff and it's like, it's such a competitive field and yet people are so incredibly generous when it comes to suggesting their friends or their students or like someone that they've come across themselves in a zine rack in, in a comic book store. So it sort of like did become this sort of self-perpetuating like, you know, snowball kind of thing. I do find those two directions really fascinating in terms of the evolution of cartooning as a, I don't know, industry or a field that on the one hand, I mean, it used to be, used, like the New Yorker kind of stands alone at this point in terms, of, in terms of publishing this kind of material. That's gotta affect how people view you, view, view the, the, the format, right? Yeah, well, I mean, it used to truly be that like on batch day, whatever day of the week it was at the time, currently Tuesdays, um, you know, people would just bring a big pile of cartoons. They'd start at the New Yorker because we paid the most. I think they went to the Saturday Evening Post next because they had donuts. But they would just go from public <laughs> Playboy, you know, these like hyper specific print publications, you know, like about cars, I don't know, whatever. But they would just sell all of their cartoons and then they'd go back upstate to their houses and, you know, pay off their mortgage and like put their kids through private school. And like that is not a thing that's happening now for single panel gag cartoonists, um, which is tough for it as an industry, if you want to think about that. But sort of the plus side is that like all of these people who are, you know, do animation and write for late night and, you know, bartend and it's a hustle, but it, but it means you get these, you know, people who are like, coming from all these different backgrounds who are having all these different experiences, who like, have all these different points of view that, that are then also entering this like world of gag cartooning. Uh, so it's like you get more of a energy from different starting points because it's like 
not like people who are in the hermetically sealed gag cartoon. And it's universe. tough because it's like tough to encourage people to keep trying when they're doing all these other hustles that will take up their time while also, you know, raising children and whatever. But like, um, yeah. So I mean, it's 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 you don't have people whose like only thing is honing this one craft and over time, you know, producing this vast body of work. But yeah, it's a it's a toss up. And luckily, we currently still have both because there are people like, you know. Raj Chast, and even younger cartoonists who've like really made a go of it, like Liana Fink, who is, you know, she works incredibly hard, but you know, what she does is draw cartoons. And then the flip side is, uh, what you're saying is that there's more graphic, g graphic stuff than ever, you know, partly because of the internet, partly because of just publishing graphic novels, renaissance. Um, interested in that kind of material, and there is a way that a New York that a cartoon is gag cartoon is kind of like a proto meme, you yeah, know. I and and you, see, you, you see, you see, that you, you see that oh, you. I thought I just made that up. Uh, you, you see, um, you see people memeing New Yorker cartoons, or it's a it's a format that gets uh, you know twisted around to 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 make various kinds of uh, uh, you know to become a form of comment commentary. I mean, um, how has the internet changed the audience? How has it changed the sense of humor that people have? Yeah, I mean, well, like a meme is, I like the phrase proto-meme, you know, so do all the like coders who are working on various like archive reissue, because pro proto-meme, then we know what that means. Um, but it's like, you know, it's image, line, like boom, joke, instantly consumed, like, super easy to share. I mean, the New Yorker cartoons Instagram account is wildly popular. People love tagging their friends and, ones and, and sharing them. Um, so that's all been great for the medium. And, um, and even the cartoon caption contest is <laughs> really like, I mean, I'm leans, so glad you brought it up. <laughs> leans into that. Well, you have to you know someone's going to ask the question <laughs> in the Q&A. So. Uh, but really leans into that. You know, they take an image and you permeate it with new with new, um, you know, let people kind of like add their own uh, message to it or. You know. Yeah, I mean, and one of the great things is that like when we post these things on Instagram, sometimes it's the daily cartoon, which is super responsive, often about like something political or, you know, happening in the news that day. Um, and people, of course, respond to that because it's the, you're in the churning news cycle of social media. But people also will publish a cartoon from like 1984 about a dog and it's just like, it blows up again. So part of what I'm working on now beyond, you know, pushing the limits of like what, you know, technology can help us do with cartoons in terms of like, uh, you know, augmented reality stuff, animated stuff. Um, but, but also we're, we're working on trying to like, open up the archive because there is so much there. Sure, some of it is very dated. There's like nag they're nagging wife cartoons from the like, you know, 30s that just are like, I can't believe we're, just, yeah, have at it people. But there's so much there that is so great and people love to dig into it and like rediscover it. Do you think though that, I mean, internet humor is so weird. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I really, I mean, it's just the kind of like uh, non sequitur uh, type of uh, internet comedy and... Uh, yeah, but what is life after Mozart? That's like... True, true enough. <laughs> no, no, and, and I think it's, it's been great. Like, I, I love the weirdness of internet comedy. That's sort of what I came up on. And um, I think it's uh, given me some leeway and given the New Yorker some leeway to be weirder because it's sort of mainstream. It's like, you know, there are no gatekeepers really to the internet and what is successful and viral on the internet when it comes to comedy. And so like that stuff sort of rises whether or not institutions um, anoint it. And, but then the institutions get to like play with it. Mm -hmm. So that's a fun thing for me. Well, it's just, I do think, I mean, just same way the kind of alt-weekly alt energy kind of folded mm -hmm. into, into, into the, into the, um, the magazine. I mean, I, I gotta imagine the internet's everywhere and everything now, so I gotta imagine it affects what you get, what gets submitted to you. Yeah, and it's like, I don't know, it's, it's talking about like the alt week losers, the New Yorker, it's like, we're not like an ivory tower. It's like me, I'm the cartoon editor. Well, obviously, <laughs> you fe it feels a bit like one to the, uh, to the thousands of cartoonists uh, trying to decode the, <laughs> your every, uh, your every, uh, Punctuation. Yeah, little do they know. I just like go home and look at like 
cheese has cheeseburger memes and like <laughs> TikToks of like people, you know, unboxing. <laughs> so we're gonna do a, we're gonna get to a Q and A. So get your um, your cues ready um, in just a second, and I just have two more questions okay. before that. So uh, maybe let's let's flip ahead to one of the bleaker ones. <laughs> None of these seem bleak to me. These all seem fine. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty bleak. Um, I, I just, uh, um, you know, how, how, I guess my question is, this was the last five years, the vibe of the last five years has been... Bad. Bad vibes. Bad vibes. And it's been, um, it's kind of been a uh, discussion about uh, how it's affected comedy and, uh, and... And what it means to even be funny now, when you know, in the world, the news cycle is very volatile. And uh, and I know from working on the internet myself that you're getting jerked around a lot by by current events. And and I imagine working on a weekly cycle can can totally throw you off. I mean, how much has the the, the kind of the political uh, uh, conversation filter into your world? Yeah. Well, I mean. I, there's a comedian I love who tweeted, like, Trump was good for comedy in the way that a train crash is good for an emergency room. Um, <laughs> which, <laughs> take that as you will. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the sort of lightning speed news cycle, the political volatility, the sort of, like, horror of the world that we have been living through, um, ecologically, politically, so, so, so it's um you know it's fodder for satire for sure and you know it's it's a uh, becomes a question of like how much do you like scramble to get the joke about the thing that is just like disappearing into the mm -hmm. you know hour ago sub or you know deep conscious of the mind that's already moved on to the next thing um, and I think it's important um, obviously like satire is a way to needle power and point out the sort of like absurdities of the world at large is something I think about a lot. But on the flip side also, especially with New Yorker cartoons, there's like an element of escapism and like a release valve that comes from, maybe not this cartoon, but <laughs> that comes from a, that comes from maybe the cat hero's journey cartoon that comes from just like having a, you know, a, a sort of like single laugh as you're working your way through an article about you know, whatever it is, Fallujah, and you just like, you get a joke about a cat. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always served that purpose, and I, you know, I think it, I think it can do both things. Are there things you haven't published, or they're, they're you know, you've had to re-steer, re, rejigger what you're doing because of current events? Well, I mean, the pandemic was a big one where it's like, okay, we have to figure out how to publish a cartoon where someone's going to be wearing a mask, but we're also going to know who's talking, and like, <laughs> um, yeah, and, um, you How know, did you solve that problem? <laughs> Some distance talking, lots of cats and dogs who, you know, weren't infecting one another. Um, but, but it was a weird moment because everyone, nobody knew how to react. Some PhD thesis will correlate the <laughs> oh, rise absolutely. of cat and dogs I look forward to being a during the in pandemic that. in relationship. Um, no, but it was also like everyone had the first, same first thoughts where it's like a cruise ship is coming to pick you up on an island. Like, oh, no thanks, I'm not getting on a cruise ship. Or like, <laughs> we're all hoarding beans, but we're also out of toilet paper. We didn't do any of those cartoons. But like, you know, it was like people, or the, my favorite was, I think I got 10,000 cartoons where it was like, a man and a woman usually are a couple, and one of them was saying, like, ah, me and Harold, we've been social distancing for years. Like, you know, it was like, there was a bit of, like, a... But so everyone had the first, same first thoughts, and then this amazing thing happened where everyone had these, like, many, many other different approaches that were, like, personal about their own experiences in quarantine with their loved ones or their pets or whatever. Um, so... I forget what the question was. <laughs> I mean, Just things you didn't publish, things, of, things yeah. that you have to oh, steer clear no, of. No, I mean, I think there's nothing really to steer clear of. I was trying to think, like, whether it's like the New Yorker cartoon can never be blank. And then I was thinking about this cartoon that I bought recently. I won't give away any of the part of the joke, but it features, like, a lot of the actor Richard Kind, like, a lot of Richard Kinds. And I was like, if we can publish a cartoon featuring multiple character actor <laughs> Richard Kind in a room. <laughs> like, pretty much the sky's the limit. I mean, other than things that are, like, 
you know, intentionally confusing or, you know, cruel or, it's, you know, it's, I think pretty, we've got boobs in, we got penises in at this point. Barriers uh, your are dream, being your dream is complete. You've, <laughs> you've just disrupted the paradigm. Um, okay, two more questions from me, and then then uh, and then we will turn it to the audience. Um, how much do you hear from the audience? How much do you care? This audience? No, the, the, the New Yorker audience. This, so you people, we really care about. Um, but no, from just on the day to day, you're, uh, you know, like, is there a lot of feedback from? There's some, I mean, and posting stuff on social media has been great for like people engaging and being excited about it. When I definitely like New Yorker readers love to send things through the mail. Um, and I got New Yorker like, readers. Yeah. I got like a lot of letters and they'd always be on such like beautiful stationery. There was one that was like a card and had butterflies on it. And I was like, oh. And then it was just like a tirade about like I hate the cartoons now. The cartoons were so much better when I was. And <laughs> I mean, I love to get mail, so it's mostly bills. Um, but like, I don't know. I sort of, I, I, it's not my favorite activity to read all this, but it's like, I get it too, because it's like, I, you know, The New Yorker is 97 years old. SNL is 47 years old. Everyone is like, the best SNL cast was the one from when I was 22. And it's like, yeah, of course, there's like, you've, you've become very devoted to these familiar characters. And like, hopefully they continue to be peppered throughout. Of course, it takes a while to become adjusted to the, you know, new cast members. But I mean, I do get it. It's like, this is, people treasure their experience with The New Yorker and it changes heart. <laughs> well, I guess the reason I ask is, yeah. is I get the impression that people really care about the cartoons. The more about the caption contest. More yeah. about the caption contest. No, no, no. But they, they, no, they absolutely do, which makes my, you know, again, when everyone's like, you must have the most fun job in the world. And it's like, yeah, it's this like incredibly weirdly high stakes editing of single line jokes. <laughs> okay, my last question for me. Um, finally, Emma Allen, you've said that the greatest passion, your greatest passion in all of this and concern is to make sure we keep the art form alive. So what does that mean to you? Um, obviously, the content and the form can change. We've talked about that, but what's the what's the core of it all that you're? I mean, I do think people are like, oh, you know, this type of image does not appear in as many places anymore. Does that mean, you know, like painting, <laughs> it's dead? <laughs> you know, and I think like painting being dead over and over again throughout every like wave of new medium avant-garde like I don't think it's dead at all I think it like is finding its new place in this robust world that I've been describing um, and I don't know I just I, again as I was saying like people still the the deep love for the archive proves to me that like it's not like the old cartoons from past decades are these little mummies that are like historic historical relics it's like these things maintain this vibrancy and like the really good ones are just funny forever. <laughs> and so it's it's hard to do something like that. Like if you think about memes memes, not my proto memes, but the like memes memes, oftentimes I miss a week of a meme and it's like, it doesn't make any sense anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, Ryan Gosling and the Barbie movie set with text overlaid. It's like, you miss that moment, it's gone. Um, but there are some cartoons that are just like, they will always be funny. And it's like to keep, to have artists keep trying to make that type of joke that is this perfect alchemical combination of art and perspective and, you know, experience and sense of humor is like, that's so great. That's, <laughs> that's, that's sort of eternal. Well, that is a wonderful note to uh, shepherd us into the Q and A period. I'm gonna change to a different cartoon so we don't just keep. Yes. Yeah, so let's look at the tote bag one. There. <laughs> um, and we have about 15 minutes for Q and A. Although we can keep talking, I'm sure. Um, we have one right here. The last question that you asked her, uh, I think, was very interesting. Maybe some other people from the audience would have an answer to it as to why this art form of a cartoon would continue. My answer, very short, would be it's part of human nature. The human nature is not changing. Human nature, they, I've even read recently that they think back in time with Neanderthals, that even over the centuries, our human nature, uh, it, there are a lot of things that are very similar with humor. 
Um, and I don't know, I'd love other people to comment on that. I'm sure there are literally cartoons with I'm Neanderthals. I'm thinking about there's, yeah, there's a Liana Fink cartoon where it's like, it's like a Neanderthal's drawn on the cable and it's like, oh, I just can't think of a caption. <laughs> you, sir. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's just, let's, let's go ahead and um, get the microphone to you so everyone can hear. <clears throat> I didn't see, unless I missed it, any political cartoons that you showed. Yep. Are you editorially stopped from putting political cartoons in, or uh, are you dictated by the powers that be at the magazine uh, who you can make fun of and who you can't? No. Um, we mainly restrict the more political stuff to the daily cartoon, which is published every day online, and just because of the sort of um, news cycle of it all, where it's more editorial reactive, more in the classic sense of an editorial cartoon reactive to something that's happened. That isn't to say, I mean, uh, we have published some cartoons in the magazine, certainly of late, that like depict actual politicians. Um, and I think you probably know the general bent of the New Yorker's politics, but that doesn't mean... <laughs> oh, anyway, it's, it's probably more um, left-leaning. Uh, but... Uh, so, or you, or so, you wouldn't be here. What? If it wasn't left-leaning, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what that means, but right. thanks. Uh, yeah, um, here, here. <laughs> um, but... Uh, Are you in charge of the daily? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Um, is that, so that must be, a, is that a different, it's a different selection it's, process? It's, yeah, it, so it's every single morning versus every single week. And but basically the um, cartoons also, as I was sort of alluding to, they like, sit around for a while, they go through fact-checking, copy, um, legal, they are ultimately slotted into the magazine. So they tend not to be immediately reactive to things that are newsy, with, with a, few, um, a, a few exemptions when, when it's you know, something that like, really feels like deserving of immediate parody. Uh, I think we're lucky because I think. Oh, he. I, I can. I'll, I'll repeat it. He asked, um, "What if sort of about uh, simultaneous submissions? What if you're a cartoonist and you send a cartoon to various outlets at the same time and it's accepted by a few?" Um, we, the New Yorker, I feel like is lucky because. Uh, at this point in time, and even as I was saying at the beginning, because we paid the most even back in like the 30s, we were sort of the first pick for um, cartoonists, so they tend to submit first. Um, and we do have a note about like saying if it's a simultaneous submission, just so that, um, you know, if it's something that's timely, we can sort of get our response out. I keep saying we, the railway, but I can get our response out early um, and make sure to nab it. But so it, it rarely happens with the cartoons. It happens more often, I would say, with written humor pieces where people are, you know, doing these sort of like immediate satirical responses and trying to find a home for it as quickly as possible. So that's just trying to prioritize responding to ones that are, you know, going to be a flash in the pan soon. And I have a question in the back. Just to follow up that comment about the daily political cartoon, why is there a dearth of conservative political cartoonists? I don't know. I've actually gotten this question before, and I've never really, I don't have a great answer. Um, is there, or is it just the New Yorker has a pers particular perspective that determines who submits? Yeah, certainly what crosses probably my, you know, email inbox threshold is already um, going to be weighted in one direction. But I, it is a question also of just like whether out there there is, you know, a, a venue that publishes a lot of conservative political cartoons. Um, and even whether there's like, you know, the equivalent to The Daily Show or, um, you know, the sort of like wealth of strongly progress progressive political humor that is pretty mainstream at this point, whether there's an antidote. And I don't really know. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't really, like, I have not really encountered it. Um, and I don't know why. Over here. Thank you. I'm curious whether um, the caption contest um, cartoons 
did they come with a, um, a caption and then you decide it's going to be in the contest? And if so, does the um, cartoonist ever come back to you and say, that's not what I intended at all? And that's a really great question. Um, yeah, no, so sometimes cartoonists will submit images just without a caption, being like with the caption contest in mind. And the cartoons that work best for the caption contest are ones where there's sort of one strange thing and one person clearly is commenting on it. Um, so it, there's no confusion about who's speaking or what, what the thing that the joke is about is. Um, but more often than not, it is I will have a cartoon and I will be like, ooh, this isn't going to sell, but it's a great caption contest. You know, they get paid the same amount of money, but it, they're certainly... Really, they get paid the same amount of money for the... There are certainly cartoonists who feel like I have sort of, like, performed an act of decapitation. And they, like, really... There are some who love it, and it's, like, very fun to engage with the, you know, their wider fan base and see if people come up with captions that they like even more than the one they originally had. But there are some who I learned very quick on the job. It was not, they, they did not want to entertain the, poss the, the possibility of having theirs in the caption contest. It was too painful. Now, I see there are a bunch of hands. I'm going to just say to our hosts that I do not have a timer up here anymore. We have, we had 15 minutes slotted. I don't want to tax Emma's patience, but I can go on, I can go on as long as, until someone cuts us off. So just, I don't, have, I don't have a timer going. We have a question right here. Yes, thank you very much. I want to pick up on Bonnie's very good point that it's natural as part of human nature. And look at the flip side of that. It's natural and it's part of human nature, but the New Yorker is the only one I know that does these kind of cartoons, okay? So if it's such a rage, which I believe it is, and so natural, why don't the other magazines do it? Why doesn't the New York Times do it? Why doesn't the Wall Street Journal do it? Why are there so few publications that do this do if, if it's so natural and so wonderful? I think it has to do more with the media landscape, sadly, at this point than, I mean, it's, the New York Times does, you know, objective journalism. They don't do, they very rarely do sort of like entirely silly things. The other magazines that used to publish this type of cartoon in large part are not published <laughs> anymore. And, and there still are, I mean like Wine Spectator still publishes um, single panel gags. It's just their circulation and their, you know, their presence in our shared cultural experience is, is less than it once was. It's, you know, these are not publications that we're all getting five of every week delivered to our door. Um, that being said, these are being published online. I mean, people have, you know, Patreon, Medium accounts um, where they have people who pay to come and see their gag cartoons. Um, so they're creating sort of their own mini publications, um, not to mention what they're putting up on Instagram and you know sharing on other social media platforms. This is really the paradox of the internet age that there's more of everything. There's more of everything, but it's less centralized and it's less easy to find exactly those conversations. It is a very digital. Um, I mean, it is a very uh, pen and ink look, the, the New Yorker cartoons. So I wonder if that does affect uh, It's interesting, though. So this one... Uh, I assume it's not, actually. I assume that's... Uh, this one is like a digital a, drawing, although she has drawing, now yeah. shifted to doing more pen and ink. Um, and people, I think, increasingly work in more of a hybrid model um, where they, you know, the joy of being able to touch something up or make an edit that I request on an iPad to something that they've drawn and scanned is you know, easier in some ways than going back to the drawing board, board as it were. I, I know that there are more uh, up here in the front. Uh, do we have a microphone? Oh. How many more you got in you? What a lovely presentation. Thank you so much. I've been a subscriber to The New Yorker for decades. My question for you is, is there a New York cartoon hanging in your kitchen now, <laughs> and if so, which one is it, and if not, what's your favorite ever? Oh, man. I mean, favorite ever... Well, didn't you grow up with one in your kitchen? Yeah, the Ross Chaz when Moms Dance sort of is perhaps among my favorites ever. Um, 
there's so many favorites, and I get into dangerous territory naming anything too recent. Cartoons that are currently up, I have a couple in my bathroom. <laughs> Don't read it too much into that. Um, but uh, I have a couple, my now husband, um, I was not yet cartoon editor, but I was editing humor at The New Yorker, and he was a finalist for the caption contest. And then they realized that this was obviously not going to fly, that Alex Lenchy was going to be printed as a finalist in the caption contest when he had an in. Um, but we got, Michael Maslin gave us a, a print of it with his, or print of it with his caption, which is hanging in our bathroom. That's a, that's a much beloved one. <laughs> not gonna name a favorite uh, child, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, watch the, that Slack channel blow up. In the, in the back, in the back. So I just absolutely love New Yorker cartoons, as I can imagine everyone in this room does as well. And I have one hanging in my room, and it is uh, two just like grocery store balloons flying together, and one of them says, I have a dream one day to fly in the Macy's Day Parade. <laughs> I think that's Nick Stevens. That's a great cartoon. It is so good. It's like the sweetest, most inspirational and aspirational, you know, cartoon that I feel like I've read. <laughs> and I was going to ask a question about the uh, caption contest, but now I feel self-conscious because <laughs> apparently that's an obvious question. So my question is, do you think it's actually possible to read a full New Yorker <laughs> front to back every single week? <laughs> Well, if it is, I'm not the woman who's proven it, so. Isn't, um, isn't there a scene in that show, The Quiet Place, where a picture of hell is like an empty room where just New Yorkers <laughs> are slowly stacking up? Um, it's kind of like a New Yorker cartoon. It's really depressing. I go on vacation and I like bring a stack of New Yorkers to read like on the beach, <laughs> just catching up. Um, I don't know, I think David Remnick pretty much does it, and then he also does all the other things he does. So if we can ever get his magic pill, we should all take it immediately. Got one up here and then one back with the hat um, on the aisle. Question about the creative process, do, hey. do they, when the, the cartoonists, when they're making these cartoons, do they usually have an idea and write the words first, the pictures first, and then some of the greatest cartoons need to be only pictures without, without any words at all that, that are so intuitive. So, is there a process? Where I've heard a lot of cartoonists talk about this, and I, I think it really varies from person to person. Um, there are people who are always words first people. There are, o there are people who are always picture first people. Um, and then there are some who it changes from, you know, gag to gag. So, I mean, it's it's a, you know, I've talked a lot Somewhere about it over time. born is just a It still is a sort of th mystical, yeah, <laughs> born. Yeah, born, they just wake up in the middle of the night, pen in hand. Um, no, but it's... I wish I, I wish there was a you know a, some some set of rules we could all follow to suddenly make what they make, but it's born from their strange minds and hands. Right here, and I think we'll do two more after that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the conversation. It's very illuminating. Um, especially toward the end when you're, I think you were getting really good and gritty, thank you. <laughs> now, as far as, and I, and I do want to follow up on this question of what is, what is very natural. I think, as a reader of, <clears throat> yes, decades, as many of us are, um, I think of these as, as ringing true in some way to, to human experience. Now, it may not be exactly my experience, but there is something of the truth in that. However, I wonder if there isn't something about the demographic of who subscribes to The New Yorker that a lot of these are going to be hospitable. If you consider, uh, you know, socioeconomic group or, uh, you know, center-right, center-left politics or whatever. So I'm kind of wondering about the, the demographics of it, if that isn't part of what may ring true for me. So, ask you, unless you've got the demographics at your head, because um, I do have a real question, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, I thought, okay, well, I thought that was a question. I mean, I guess um, my feeling is that, you know, without getting too nitty gritty into the demographics, is that they're um, sort of wide ranging. The readership of The New Yorker is not a single demographic. 
um, and that <laughs> no, and that and that you know it's uh, very important to me that like people reading the the New Yorker. Um, who are from different backgrounds and have different lived experiences, like can look at the cartoons and not feel like forcibly alienated from them. Um, and of course, that means that like not everyone will immediately identify perfectly based on their own lives with every single cartoon. And you know, they're ones that will forever, in a Seinfeldian way, be inaccessible <laughs> to certain readers, and ones that, like, you know, I don't publish them, but certainly ones that I receive that I do not understand at all and have to, you know, do a, attempt a deep dive to, or you know, Google search to figure out. But, but I mean, I think I think that's okay. <laughs> I hope that's okay, and you know, I'll still get the letters and the beautiful butterfly note cards. But that's. How it is. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm making Emma available for two more. We got one over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The question is because that wasn't really a question, but it turned into one. Thank you very much. The question is this as the cartoons are being placed in mm -hmm. the magazine itself, to what extent is there uh, a strategy about placement, um, all of that kind of thing? Uh, you there's know, a visual, huge, yeah, yeah, yeah. thematic, there's a, all of that. There's Thank a you. huge strategy. So there's there's the sort of like logistical element of these stories are being edited over the course of the week, and so their lengths are in flux. So we, you know, attempt to place something that will theoretically fit, and then you know, all it takes is like. You know, Dexter Filkins writes over 10,000 words, and we have to suddenly scramble to find something else, which is why we keep a big bank of them in part, so that dimension wise, size wise, we have things that will work. Um, throughout the entirety of the magazine, there's an attempt to have a variety of styles and subject matters. And then there's also a woman who is the A issue editor, and part of her job is she, in fact, does read every issue of every week before it even comes out. And she has to figure out, you know, where the ads are placed, what the stories are, what the art is in the story, and then if the cartoon, both visually and you know, topic-wise, has some strange resonance. So you don't like want a Grim Reaper story, a cartoon in a story that's about you know, mass murder. So, so there, is, there is actually like a huge amount of um, effort put into that, which is, yeah, it's, it's an incredible thing to see. I play some, some small part in it, but it's a yeah, huge group effort. Over here. Thank you. Um, so my New Yorker cartoon on my wall has been on the wall since probably 2003 or 04. It's sort of a post-Patriot Act thing, and it's a very, it was very specific because it was an entire page. Uh -huh. And it's a middle-aged man coming out of his house, sort of suburban setting, with tanks and fighter jets and shock troops coming after him. And the caption is, the last secular humanist is flushed from his spider hole. Okay. <laughs> It is like so on the nose political, and it's not about a politician, but it is definitely an yeah. editorial cartoon of that era. And it's so on the nose almost to be like not that funny, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of a bummer if you're into that, if, you're, if that's your political point of view. I'm curious where the line is between cartoon editing and political editorial editing organizationally, right? Because again, as a full page spread, this felt like a very different thing. I'm trying to remember, was that Barry Blitt? I can't remember who that I was. I don't remember the exactly. author. Um, uh, it's, I mean, it's all sort of a group effort. Francoise, who's the, Francoise Muley, who is the cover editor, um, she and I work together with Barry Blitt, who does a lot of, he does these fetch books online now that he won a Pulitzer for um, that are very pointed and political, and he does a lot of our more political covers. Um, so it's a group effort. I do think there was a, moment in recent political history where the New Yorker um, sort of like realized that they were going to collectively take a more strident political stance, that it was not an effort to be um, objective above all else, that there was a need to sort of do more uh, editorial cartooning. And um, so I think it, it, it shifts. It shifts based on the moment we're reacting to and how much it feels like an urgent need to like come at it from every angle, you know, every medium, photography, editorial, um, you know, feature. Surely writing. this must be a big part of that conversation with David Remnick every, every week is trying to walk that line and 
yeah. with, with the weekend. And just like arguing with him about a dumb dog joke that I think is funny and he thinks is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not, again, it's just not all so dark. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, we, I, we'll, we'll have one more then and then, then, then we'll let people um, retreat. <laughs> retreat. <laughs> right, right here, we had, we, yeah. Thank you so much for this. Um, I want to go through your trash. I want to see the rejects, <laughs> 1,500 down to 60. You let, where do we find the 60 or the 100 that almost made it? That, that was, and, and then I thought, you know, who are the names we should look out for? I don't know all the names uh, of everyone. I want, you know, I'd love to have a list from you of the, the names to look out for. You know, is anybody publishing that w bigger body of work? Okay, well, one thing is Matt Diffie, He's republishing, it's a, it's a slightly updated version of an older book, so take with a grain of salt. Most of the cartoons were not rejected by me, and so many of the rejected cartoons I really like. Um, but I just, I wrote the introduction to his reissue of the Rejection Collection, which is a great, great book in that it has interviews with the cartoonists about like why they think cartoons were rejected by, um, you know, various, uh, both the preceding administration and some by me, and then you know just about the process of submitting and how they come up with their ideas. It's really wonderful and has some really truly great cartoons and deeply terrible cartoons in it. So you'll get you'll get a sense of the the range of what I see. Um, and then I also Ink Spill is a blog that Michael Maslin, the cartoonist. Um, keeps and he does a really great job. He has a full list of all of the cartoonists who have ever submitted with bios and some information. Whenever there's a new cartoonist who comes in, he introduces them. Um, he does a great historical look um, at different you know, cartoonists from uh, past decades. It's a great place to a starting point, I think, to like learn more about who's submitting and then you know follow up on your own and see what they're publishing or what they're posting on Instagram. Um, and I think we're also, on our Instagram, we do these cartoon challenges where cartoonists um, guide comedians through drawing cartoons, which is their great little vignettes that sort of showcase some of the cartoonists um, who are working now and how they work and who they are. Well, on that, thank you to Emma Allen. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to all of you for being here.